Good evening. Praise the Lord for uh, another wonderful evening tonight that uh, we're going to, we're on our second night for our gospel meeting. So our uh, topic for this evening is a tragic life without God. Now let me start the lesson tonight uh, by asking a question. What does man seek in his lifetime? I know I asked this question in this congregation, in, in some other congregation. And uh, the answer to that question is, happiness. And uh, I guess the, the monkey isn't too happy to have me, uh, to have a selfie with me. So happiness. Well, Blaise Pascal once said that all men seek happiness. There are no exceptions. However different that means uh, they may employ, they all strive towards this goal. And this is the motive of every act of every man, including those who go and hang themselves. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. Even those who took their own lives, you know, their motive is happiness because they want to escape the pain and the suffering and the miseries in their life. So that's why they want to end their life thinking that they will be happy. So they take their lives and thinking that the pain, the sufferings will stop and it will end their misery. So they take their lives. But is it true? But is it true? Did it stop the pain? Did it stop the suffering? Did it stop their misery? Or probably they will just start to feel the real pain. Or probably they will just start to feel the real suffering and what it means to be miserable in the afterlife. Now Christians like you and I, we also seek happiness. We seek happiness in our lifetime. That's why we try our very best. We try our very best to remain faithful to God, whatever happens. And the ultimate happiness we seek is in heaven. Amen. It is in heaven because in heaven, the source of our joy is there. The source of our joy is God. The greatest of joy is God. Then I will go to the altar, to God, the altar of God, to God, my greatest joy. I will praise you with the harp, O God. And he is in heaven. That's why we want to go to heaven because God is there. And going to heaven, it means the salvation of our souls. So number one that I would like to share with you tonight, dear brethren and friends, a tragic life without God means there is no salvation. According to Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So the idea of salvation, my dear brethren and friends, is being saved from something. That is the very concept. That is the very idea of salvation, being saved from something. So we must answer the question, what are we saved from? To better understand the meaning of salvation. What are we saved from? Romans 5 verse 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved. From what? From the wrath of God. So number one, we are saved from the wrath of God. The second reason is we are saved from what? Eternal death. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. Because of sin, we are destined to receive the wrath of God. And by that wrath of God, eternal death awaits us. But because Jesus... What he did on that faithful day, 
dying on the cross, salvation now becomes available to you and I. Meaning that our deliverance from the consequence of sin is now available. We have crossed over from death to life. According to John chapter 5, verse 9. Truly, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Indeed, he has crossed over from death to life. Hallelujah. Amen. We have crossed over from death to life. Now, if there would be no salvation for those who don't have God, therefore, what is waiting for them is not heaven, but rather hell. Now, there are just two destinations of man after this life. And make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, it's either heaven or it's hell. According to Matthew 25, verses 34 and 41, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So there is no salvation. A tragic life without God. Now, second I want to talk to you about is that hell awaits you. If you don't have Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hell is a place of eternal torment for the unrepentant soul. I always say that hell is a prepared place for the unprepared individual while heaven on the other hand is a prepared place for the prepared individual now a while ago we mentioned about the wrath of god what is the wrath of god okay what does this wrath of god look like or should i say feel like okay if there is one subject in the Bible, that is not so pleasant to talk about, it is the subject of hell. Many people don't want to talk about hell. Hmm? And some people even don't believe in the existence of hell. Because for these people, the very thought of hell is inconsistent with the very nature of God, being God, being merciful, being loving, being forgiving. Their thought would be that how can a, a loving God send people to hell? It seems to them that, you know, doesn't make any sense at all. Well, this would be my answer to them. Number one, we are forgetting the other nature of God, that he is a just God. That means what you reap, you will reap what you sow. Am I correct? And second, God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves to hell because we continue to defy the Lord and continue to live in our sins. So don't blame God. Eventually, if we will be in hell, don't blame God at all. And those who are so boldly opposed to the idea of the existence of hell are probably trying to justify their non-obedience to God. That's why they oppose the idea of hell. And for those, for others, they don't want to talk about hell because it is so disturbing and it scares them so much. Well, you know what, brothers, sisters, and friends, I will just do that tonight. 
I will scare the evil out of us through the truth of the gospel so that we will come to the grim reality of dying without God. We don't want to die without the Lord. But for those who are here tonight who have not yet accepted the Lord the biblical way, I hope that after this lesson, you will approach me or some of the brothers here and accept Jesus Christ the biblical way so that you will not go to hell. Now, what if, just hypothetically, what if, if the ground shakes this very moment and this building would collapse and kill us all? My question is, Will you go to heaven or will you go to hell? Now, it is a serious question that demands our utmost attention. Because in fact, that is so serious even to God. So serious that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that we would have hope in heaven and none of us would spend eternity in hell that is why to God it is important so in a tragic life without God you would feel the wrath of God second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9 they will suffer punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might that's why the book of Hebrews warns us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it is a fearful, it is dreadful, it is terrible, it is so terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, let me ask you this. So, what is it in hell? What is it like in hell? The Bible tells us in Jude chapter 1, verse 13, blackness of darkness. There is darkness. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars from whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Jude tells us that those who follow the way of sin will be in hell where they will be in blackness of darkness or blackest of darkness in other translations. Now in the book of Matthew, it is called outer darkness, outside darkness, or simply put, darkness. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 12 tells us that those belonging to the Jewish nation, the sons of the kingdom, who don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah will be thrown out into the outer darkness. In Matthew 22, verse 13, tells us about a parable of the banquet where a man was improperly dressed for righteousness, spiritually unready to live a life without God. He was thrown into the outer darkness. In Matthew 25, verse 30, talks about the parable of the talents where the worthless servant is thrown into the outer darkness. Now, the all all Bible commentaries, scholars that I read, they are one in saying that what Jude was referring to and what Matthew was referring to about the darkness, it refers to a place called hell. Now for us to have an idea of what this blackness of darkness means or outer darkness means, do you remember the, one of the 10 plagues, the ninth plague? Darkness. You remember that? In Exodus chapter 10, 20, and uh, 23, 22 and 23. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another. Hmm. 
nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had lied in their dwellings. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine that? When you go out, you won't be able to see each other, according to the Bible. During the time, they weren't able to see each other. When you go out, out in the streets, you won't be able to see one another, not unless probably you are a few inches from one another like this. You see, the Bible tells us for three days, they did not see one another. So dark, you won't even probably see your own torso. That's what I'm thinking. And I was just thinking that probably the Egyptians tried to go out, you know, with their lamps, going out, trying to do their normal routine. But you know what? Because it was so dark, the darkness was so thick that even with lamps, they weren't probably able to see where they were going. And therefore could not do anything outside the house productively. That's why the Bible tells us nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. So that's why they just stayed inside their houses. Because nothing that they can do, even probably with their lamps, with them going out there in the streets. Now wait for it. There's more. In verse 21 of Exodus chapter 10, there's always more. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick that you can feel it. Wow. Darkness so thick that you can feel it. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? I never thought of darkness that you can feel it. How can you feel darkness? Now, it's so eerie, right? Hmm. Now, fog, I could feel. Fog. When I, was, uh, when I went to Delhi City, uh, there was so much fog, and I could feel the fog because of the cold. You know, you could, you could feel it. But when I passed through the fog, then I felt a little less of the cold. So I kind of feeling the fog. But how can you feel darkness? How can you feel darkness? Now, Bible scholars have this to say with regards to what happened during the time of uh, um, Moses, during the, uh, the, the 10 plagues. Kel and Delitz, so dark that, those, that the obscurity caused by the thickest fog in our autumn and winter days is nothing in comparison. Barnes, three days, it fills the atmosphere, atmosphere with dense masses of fine sand, bringing on a darkness far deeper than of our worst fogs in winter. Matthew Henry, it was darkness which might be felt, so thick were the fogs. It, it astonished and terrified the blindness of their minds brought upon them with this, uh, this darkness of the air. Never was mind so blinded as Pharaoh's. Never was air so darkened as Egypt. Let us dread the consequences of sin. If three days of darkness were so dreadful, what will everlasting darkness be? Can you imagine? So that's how you can feel the darkness through its fine sand. I don't know how fine the sand was, but you can feel it. It covers everything. They couldn't see anything. Not even a single glare of sunshine can pass through because of this blackness of darkness. It was so thick. See? Can you imagine if that would be like in hell? Aside from darkness, what awaits a person in hell is fire. In Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart 
from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I came across with an article from the Guinness Book of World Record, uh, World Records, that the longest full body burned without supplied oxygen. You know, those uh, who engulf themselves with fire that you see in movies and television, you know. Um, the, the longest is two minutes and 38 seconds. Two minutes and 38 seconds. So that's the time the fire would be put out, you know, probably because the person uh, is feeling already the heat. So he would only last two minutes and 38 seconds. Now, let me remind you that those or this person is a professional stuntman and he is wearing a protective suit. Uh, he is wearing a fire retardant suit and with gels all over his body. So he could last for two minutes and 38 seconds. Now, I can only imagine if that person, you know, without the fire retardant suit, without those gels, without anything, how long can he last if you set him on fire? Probably not a second, you know. He can last two minutes, 38 seconds because with all those protective gears. But imagine yourself, without those protective gears, you won't even last a second, you see. So that's how hot it is. That's how painful fire is. Hell is a place burning with fire. In Mark chapter 9, 43 and 44, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands go to hell. Into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worms not die, and the fire is not quenched. You know, a fire, it is put out in two ways. Number one, through intervention. Intervention. When there's a fire, you would like to call the firefighter, and they would intervene. They would swoop in and put out the fire. So you put out fires two ways. Number one, intervention. Number two, the fire is extinguished on its own. How? How? When there's nothing more, the fire would consume. Eventually, it will die on its own. Right? Have you seen a fire? If you put up, if you light a fire, a piece of paper, when that piece of paper is totally consumed, the fire, you don't have to extinguish the fire because the fire will extinguish itself. So those are two ways how the fire is extinguished, intervention and on its own. Now the Bible tells us that the fire in hell is what? It's not quenched. It never goes out. Why? Number one, there's no intervention. No one to put out the fire. You cannot call the firefighter to put out the fire, okay? There's nothing that you can do when you are in hell to put out the fire. And number two, those bodies in hell are continuously burned. Since it is in eternity, it just keeps on burning the person's body. Now, do you remember the burning bush? The burning bush, the bush was burning, but it was not consumed. It continues to burn, but the bush is not consumed. That uh, what would be like in hell. You, continuous, you are continuously burning, but you are not consumed. So therefore, the fire does not go out because you are continuously being consumed and burned by the fire. See? Now, in that verse, there is the worm hmm, does not die. Now, what does that mean? That a worm does not die? Well, it is a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Now, the same idea with the unquenchable 
fire. Now, these worms, they feed on dead bodies, right? They feed on dead bodies. Now, if these worms had eaten all there is to eat on the body, if there are no more dead bodies to eat, eventually they will die, like the fire. Just like the fire, it will die on its own. Now, since in hell, a person is what? A person is a living dead body. We are a living dead body. So the worm will continue feeding on you for all eternity. They don't die. So that's why the term worms does not die. You get the idea of the term worms does not die. It's a metaphor for everlasting torment in hell. Now bodies are burned in hell with fire, but never consumed. And it never ceases where the worm doesn't die and fire is not quenched. It is a never ending torment. Can you imagine if you would go there? Now talking about these things, it gives me right now, it gives me goosebumps. Really, because I don't want to go there. Now, believe it or not, whether you believe in hell or not, you read it from the Bible. We are reading it from the Bible. Many people don't believe in the idea of hell, but the Bible tells us there is hell. Now, I want you to notice that in the verses that we read a while ago about torment in hell, there is this particular praise. The praise there will be whipping and gnashing of teeth. Now, it just shows the, the miserable state of a person and the intensity of the anguish a person would experience in hell. And while you are experiencing this, you know, this anguish, this pain, you cannot just utter any word for that matter. You know, imagine if you are a carpenter, you know, um, trying to drive a nail onto that concrete wall. And all of a sudden, accidentally, you miss totally the nails and you hit your thumb so hard. What would be your reaction? How would you, be, how would you react? Number one, you would probably blurt out a quick shot, ah! and you will hold your finger like this. You will hold your, your, your thumb like this. Why? Why are you holding your thumb? Because you want to contain the pain. And probably you will be walking around back and forth because of the pain. And because of the pain, you will be weeping because it's, there's so much pain. And guess what? Weeping, and you will be grinding your teeth and you will be gnashing your teeth because of so much pain in your finger through that time of yours. And with so much pain, you cannot just say anything because there's so much pain. Because you are whipping, you are perspiring, you are grinding, you are gnashing your teeth because of so much pain, you cannot utter a single word. Imagine that for all eternity. Imagine yourself for all eternity being burned in hell, weeping, grinding your teeth, gnashing your teeth because of so much pain, so much suffering, so much torment. The Bible is not joking. The Bible is not joking. You know, because, and sometimes with so much pain, sometimes people faint. Right? Because there's so much pain, they faint. But in hell, you have no time to faint. You have no time to, Lord, excuse me. There's no time to rest even for a second. None whatsoever. It's a continuous suffering. Continuous suffering. See? You cannot avoid even for a second the pain if you are in hell. I want you to, to picture that. 
that in hell with so much suffering, with so much pain, you will be weeping, you will be gnashing your teeth, you will be in torment. Why? Because of your stubborn, because of your disobedient heart to the Lord. See? That's what hell looks like. I'm just giving you the two things, the two horrors of hell. There's more. Perspective. Perspective is important as you think of hell. What do you see in the picture? A penguin. Some would say a penguin. And some would say there's a picture of a person, a face. Some would say Abraham Lincoln. And that's not me. <laughs> perspective. When you think about hell, perspective is important. Why? I tell you. For Christians, the thought of hell should push us to continue serving the Lord with all faithfulness because we don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven. Perspective. Now, for the unbelievers, for the unbelievers and for those who were in Christ before and wandered away from him, remember my first question? My first question was, what do men seek in their lifetime? The answer is happiness. Happiness. You seek happiness. Painting a picture in your mind of the horrors of hell should drive you, should motivate you towards that which you really seek. That is happiness. Real happiness is not in this world. Real happiness, my dear brethren and friends, is not in this life. Real happiness is there in the afterlife, in heaven with God. Amen? Perspective. So if you don't have the Lord right now, or if you wandered away from the Lord, perspective. Think about what you seek. And if you are seeking real happiness, then think about hell. It will change your perspective. Think about hell. In hell, there is no happiness, but utter pain. There would be suffering. There would be misery. My dear brethren and friends, this is me. If I don't have God, a tragic life without God, this is me. I will be in hell. And that will be you too. If you don't have the Lord, and if you don't continue to live faithfully to the Lord, that will be you. It will be a tragic life ahead if you don't have God in you. Remember the rich man. When the rich man was alive, in the, in, the, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, when the rich man was alive, he found no use in the gospel because he was living a good life. But when he died, he went to Hades and he was in torment. That's when he realized the importance of the gospel. Perspective. Perspective. I want you to look at the horrors of going to hell. I want you to look at the horrors of hell very intently, and you would appreciate the cross of Jesus Christ. And you would appreciate why Jesus Christ died for you. Friends, brothers and sisters, we are all destined to eternal damnation. But because of Jesus, but because of Jesus and his cross, we can escape the horrors of hell. The Bible tells us there's no name given under heaven, given by God the Father in which we can be saved. It is only in God, Jesus Christ. I cannot save you. Nobody here can save you, but we can only guide you to the real truth. We can only point you to Jesus Christ so that you could go to heaven and not to hell. 
Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. John 6, 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That's why it is important to be faithful to God alone, to be faithful to Jesus Christ, to the Holy Spirit alone, because no other man can save you. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, each of you must repent for your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. I have just presented to you what it would be like, a tragic life without God. It is all up to you. It is all up to you. You may have your way in this life, just like the rich man had his way, but in the afterlife, you won't have your way. For finally, in the afterlife, God will have his way. God bless you all. Let us continue to be faithful to the Lord. Good evening.